Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where you are in the world. This is Tony Gordon again from the Break Free Free Monkey Mind podcast, season two, episode 11, nearly at the end of the second series. So thank you for everybody who's joined in and for all the comments and emails I've had over the last two series. It's been great. And this, so I said, this is the second last episode in this, and some has come up quite a bit recently about relationships. Um, I did an episode a couple of weeks ago about how do you tell in a toxic relationship. So I've actually been asked to look at the opposite side now, is how do you improve relationships? So what they didn't actually explain in the email was, do they mean relationships with family, with friends, with partners? So I've done a wee bit of a combination of things here, just so that people can see the main points that normally crop up and maybe give ideas what to do about them. Now, as we go through life, we adapt and change. And as we do that, we, we change relationships, we renew relationships, we make new relationships. Things always fluid, always changes throughout life. So you start thinking about it really from when you're really young. You've only got your own environment. So you've got that with your parents, your siblings, maybe aunts, uncles, grandparents, whoever visits. And then you start learning to go to school and you start seeing other things, the way other people act, the way they do things. So you start building relationships in that way with your teachers, with your other pupils. After school clubs, maybe not everybody that you normally would work about within school are in those clubs, so you meet different people there. And as you get older through secondary, you start making more and more friendships at last. You've got work colleagues after that. People who are just friends that you meet outside work and possibly girlfriends, partners, um, boyfriends, then leading to marriage and maybe even your own kids. So through all of that, you will constantly change and adapt. Your personality will change and adapt as things happen in your life. Your environment changes, your beliefs change, your values change. So how do we go through all of that and still try and keep those relationships growing or keep the way they are? Whatever way it suits you. Now, recently I was talking to someone and they explained to me a really good way of looking at this, like an analogy for it. They said they look at the relationships like a beautiful garden. If you can imagine going to this gorgeous garden, a little brick wall, it was a beautiful little gate, coloured gate, walked through it and all you could see was beautiful plant beds and they were full of blossoming flowers. And he said it made you feel good even walking in there because the smell, the look, you just felt great. And it made them think about how much effort it took to get that like that, to dig all that soil, to put the right nutrients into the soil, get the right plants to go into the soil, and make those choices to make sure that everything there is right. And you put all that hard work at the beginning, but then you've got to keep maintaining it. You've got to nurture those plants, give them the right feed if they need it, make sure they've got the right sunlight, the right water. And that sounded like a relationship when you think about it. And he said, what happens then when you don't give it that effort? The, the huge effort you make at the beginning. And what happens if you don't do that through time? Well, if you don't cultivate a relationship, like you don't cultivate the flowers, the flowers die. Weeds start to flourish and weeds overtake. And they've taken all the nutrients that the flowers need, so the weeds end up winning. So after the time when you look at it, then you come back and look through that gate. And the picture won't be the same. You might get the odd little flower here and there, but if you've got so many negative parts to it, and you've not maintained it, you've not put the effort in, it's not what you wanted to get out of it. And you start feeling a bit lost. You start thinking, how much effort is it going to take to restart that all over again and redo them? Probably more than it did at the beginning, because now you've got to get rid of all the weeds before you can start planting anything else. You probably didn't have to do that before. So I thought that was a very good analogy. And it made me think of things like couples. So one of the things is, a lot of couples say arguments. They can be small arguments. Sometimes they say so over silly things. And half the time you don't even remember what the things are afterwards. But the most important part of that is avoid deflecting the issue. Deal with that issue at that time. What I mean by that is it's so easy to say, well, you did this last week or last month or you never did this last week or last month. And you should really be concerned. I know what happened last week or last month, but what happened now? For example, if they never done something today, why didn't they do it today? Rather than jumping on saying, oh, they've just not done it again, there could be a valid reason, but we don't always hear that back. So I mean, for example, someone's to go to the shops and get you something. And whatever happened, came and said, oh, you should ask where it is. And before you get a chance to speak, you're already going to tirade to them for not doing it and bringing up all these other times. But that simple thing could just be that they're there, 
that sometimes the shops not had what they were looking for. They didn't want to get something that wasn't the right one. So they thought they'd just leave it and then go back and try later on the next day when they could get what the person wanted. But you don't always notice that because you're already listening to reply. And what I mean by that is, as soon as they said, ah, oh, well, or sorry, or whatever, you're already at reply to them. So, oh, yeah, this always happens. Or this is what you do. you just done something. You've done something for you, not for me. Does that sound familiar? you? And then they start biting back the same. Well, you've done this before, or you've done that, and they cast things up. And before you realise it, you've got a full-blown argument, which could have been really simply avoided by just a simple question, oh, what happened that you couldn't get it? Simple as that. So try that next time when you do have something. Try and keep yourself calm when you know that something's bothered you. And just to ask the question first and listen for the answer, not listen until you can jump in. Just try that and see what happens. You may be surprised. But one thing as well, if the person who didn't do it, didn't do it for no apparent reason or they've got an excuse, there's no point in that. Just say sorry. If you're in the wrong and you own up to your part in that situation, say sorry. It may be just that they've done something or you've done something that didn't come across the right way or you didn't mean that. It always takes two things because you take responsibilities, a wonderful tension reliever. If you want to reduce that so there's no big arguments with it, you need to make sure then if you have done something wrong, say sorry and explain that. Although sometimes that things can still be taken differently. I had an example of this recently and it's something that came out bad for me because it came the wrong way. I've always been told that I'm not very touchy-feely. I don't like hugging. I don't like touching people or that. Um, and coaching and doing it with therapy, sometimes people say to me, well, people just need reassurance. Maybe by holding a hand for a few seconds and saying, look, it's going to be okay or you can do this. Or gently touch their face and look, if they're looking away, get them to look and just say, no, you are going to be great or you're going to be fine or whatever. But I did that in a situation recently and it was taken the wrong way by the person. But... They took it because of their perception of it. Mine's maybe was I could have explained it clearer or I could have asked permission first, which I probably should have done. Then thinking on it now, in hindsight, it's always great. But because I've always told I've never really done that, that I'm a bit standoffish instead of being shown a bit more empty that way, I've learned from this that, yeah, the both sides can work as long as you get clarity, as long as you explain things the right way and say it. And... I was sorry for what I did then because I never meant to come across the wrong way. So I've apologised. Whether the other person did see that or not, I appreciate their side. It just means no, it, it was awkward for them, then that's fine. Um, I don't want to see other people having that. So make sure that when you do do something like this, say you're wrong right away and then explain why you've done it. I can explain clearly and I didn't. So that's a lesson for me. Admitting to being in the wrong shows strength of character as well. It shows that you learn from these things because you'll find that whoever the other person is, a partner, wife, husband, whatever, they would respect you more for that, the fact that you've said sorry and you've explained what's happened. And if they can understand that, that's great. But not only is accepting responsibility a sign of maturity, it can show that you're willing to learn from it and you're willing then to understand the other person's side as well, understanding their perspective. Because although you may have one intention about how you say something, how you mind, how you do an action, it may not always be taking another person the same way. So make sure that you do do the apologize right away and give that clients about why something happened. Remember, they're no mind reader. They don't know why you've done something. So you'd have to explain what it is. And some things that will benefit you doing it. Some things maybe not. And if it doesn't work at that time, you still learn for the next time. And that's what's important. But don't just go silent and walk away. That's another one people tell me to do. Uh, I've done this. I think a lot of people have done that. Probably you get to a point where you oh, I don't want more of this and just go. But this may feel good at the time because you know we're arguing and you're not, you, you don't feel like you can heat it up if you can go and calm down easily. But all you're doing is really deflecting it again because the next time you see each other, that's still festering. So the argument then can end up worse because as it festers in someone, that can turn into a full blown argument, it can turn into anger. It can turn to frustration, which all comes out the same way. And if it just being converted by just ex clearly explaining the first time, you can avoid all that. There's something to think about. There's a lot of people say they do that, they just walk away. It doesn't help. Even if the other person doesn't calm down, let them finish first before you speak. Make sure there's a pause long enough as if they're waiting for you to reply. And then do don't do it while they're speaking. 
and make sure you leave long enough after you know there is a gap. They're not just taking a breath or thinking the next thing they're going to say. So take that little bit of time. But spend the time together. It's great saying sorry things or sorting things out, but then make time for each other. Someone said that to me recently as well, is that what do you do for pleasure or for me not working? And I see we spend all my time working at the moment, but I love what I do. But yeah, I've got to make other time for family and everything, so you need to put that by as well. You need to sort of time, even your dad, your busy time, just to spend a little bit of time with your family where you can. Set that time ahead in the week before. You've got it, that's your time, or the same every week if possible, and that's your time. And nothing else comes into that. You don't change that. Because doing things like that, especially if you do things outside your comfort zone, if your comfort zone is at work, maybe the relationship is the person you have issues with, then make sure that you take the time to build that up. A bit like the garden, you need to nurture it and maintain it if things go. Because we experience fun together. Um, it releases with fun, you laugh, you smile. You get all those beautiful endorphins. You get all these emotions that come through that make you feel better. And without question, it does destabilise any argument. It will stop arguments if you're spending that time together. So try that. If you're both workaholic still, you've got to make an effort to do that. So you need to talk about that and create the time when it suits both of you. Don't just do it and say, well, I've got time here and expect them to sort of go by yours. Again, it's all about talking. Communicate. When are you free this week and this week? Why don't we do go to the pictures, go for a walk, go for a meal, go for a drink, whatever. Visit other families, whatever you want to do. Set the time aside to do that and make sure you just keep to that. So don't you both your diaries, it's in there, you've got that. I know it sounds weird putting your diary, but people say that if they don't do that, something comes in, they'll fill it and then go, ah, I forgot. And then they'll have to do whatever they've agreed. So try and do that. If it's family, rather than just the couples themselves, you want to do this, you want to encourage family members to share their feelings. Um, it, it shouldn't matter what age people are. If a family are willing to always open up and talk as a family, some people I spoke to say they actually still do something that I must have not done in a long time, but as a family, they sit down together, sometimes at the end of the day, sometimes at the end of the week, and just say, what can I wait they've had? And it just clears the air with the feelings and emotion, but it gets the children especially part of that, so they learn to understand feelings and emotions better because they're open to it, they're hearing yours and they're seeing yours and how you deal with it, and saying, ah, so if that happens to them in the future, they know how to deal with it because they've been learning. Remember, they're like sponges. Everything that's happening in the world, especially if you think through up to even teenage years, especially, maybe not to 2021, they're still taking everything from this world, everything in, and learning how to deal with these emotions. But doing it as a family can be a great way of doing that. But it also encourages them to be more open. So there may be certain situations and you prefer to speak to the mom, the dad, the partner, whoever. But if you've encouraged that to speak to as a family, they'll find that easier as well. So when they do have any bad issues or serious issues, they don't hide away from it. They don't let it build up inside, but it can end up being stress, anxiety, depression. They know they can come to use and talk. So try and build that up. And more importantly, don't pick favourites. See, so them just hear, oh, that's my baby, or this is my first. Something else I heard a lot recently in animal growing up is having what's called the middle child syndrome. For example, if you've got three, and the young one's the baby, the older one's the firstborn, the middle one sometimes can be a bit left out. And they might not always realise that, but they always seem to be vying for something with the other two. So you can sometimes find that there's arguments with them and there always seems to come drama as the middle one, but not necessarily. It can just be whatever age they are, what they're going through. They can't be bored with the younger one and the older one can't be bored with them because they're now finding other things in life to do. So it's better that when they're in their home environment, they don't see that, that they're not the same as everybody else. So treat everyone the same. I know people always say, oh, I always do that. But when you step back and think about it, do you really? Or does sometimes someone's get more favourite time than others? Again, we were talking about with the couple's relationship, scheduled time for the entire family. I said the other, some people say they do it at night, once a night or once a week and set a table for three things. I don't mean that. This is about sitting down maybe to meals together or giving each other time for to take the family out or go. We said even trips for walks, away for the day. Doing things as a family is an amazing thing for keeping the relationship built. The things you'll speak about when you're outside the fun you can have, and just how beautiful surroundings can be that children don't always notice, and sometimes they do, and you don't. So as you start growing up, you just see trees, but they see somebody play. Remember, kids can find some fun and laughter and everything, and sometimes that's what we all need. 
We need that fun and that laughter. Sometimes we're all the work and the pressures we've got in life and the responsibilities these days, we forget that. If you're always a family together, sometimes just look at your children and a wee leaf blowing up and they're chasing it or rain coming down and they're jumping in puddles. You go to the beach, they're running in out the water, playing in the sand. They have no inhibitions about doing anything like that. There's no responsibility for them and it looks great. Then why not be that in that little bit of time you've got with your family? is to be that child again. Let them see that side of you as well. And that's another great thing for bonding with your own children, but also for you as a couple. And other people see that and they go, I wish I had that. Why can't my family be that way? But they can. It's just taking that time to spend that way, that important time to spend together, quality time together. Try that and you'll be amazed how it works. Sometimes though, as relationships don't work, so it's not all about all the great things in a relationship. Sometimes they really can be things when parents just drift apart or something happens with one or the other and they fall out. And Again, because you know, arguments first start, it builds up and they find they're arguing more and more. And before you know it, you don't really spend any time together at all. And then you start avoiding each other, actually. And how difficult that is to get back when that happens. And then the arguments start. So instead of little arguments, everything becomes, it can just be the smallest little thing. You know, easy. the voice, what they do, banging doors, but they don't really, but in your head it's banged because you're expecting that. It could be the plates can then banging or not helping, not put the rubbish out, not went to shopping, whatever it is. All these things get to you and it builds up and builds up. And what we're trying to explain here is that when you've got a family environment doing that, when it's just the two of you, it can be bad enough. You need to work on that and get it. When there's a family involved and sometimes you can't really work on it there and one person might leave. It could be the mother, it could be the father, whatever. The partner. When they leave, the kids have only seen that arguments all the time. That's all they know and they can grow depending on what age they are. If they're young enough, they think that's how adults deal with things when they don't go on. They argue, they fight. Is that really how you want your kids to grow up? Do you want them thinking that's normal? Or even worse than that? Do you want them feeling like, I don't want to be like that because look at their mom and daddy was like. So they don't open up to other people. They don't really feel comfortable in relationships. And that can be even worse because they can end up being alone without really any friends or anything because they find it difficult to make them because they're always worried there's going to be an argument or there's worried they're going to leave. If you have an argument and they leave, what if I don't like something and they say it and I don't want them to go? So if they don't get them in the first place, they can't leave. And that becomes a mentality. And we don't always see that. And one thing that can happen with that and it can help is it can be just the kids are changing as well. Remember, they change throughout life. You look from two to seven, roughly, the kids are learning right from wrong. So they learn all that from the parents. If you're arguing all the time, so they think that's right. Then you've got ones going through a puberty before they know it. They're 11, 12. And that's a lot of emotions for me to take on. And if they're seeing that, we use as well. That's really difficult because they're starting to get into the big world now. Secondary school, meeting our relationship, meeting girls, meeting boys, partners. You have to think of these things. But one way it can sometimes help that is if, for example, one of you has left the home, maybe you're trying to try a separation, maybe it's just you've agreed it's not going to work. You don't have to be enemies especially with the kids involved. If you can be amicable and work out when you both get visiting things, and that's fine. But one thing can be quite powerful is they still need their values. They need to learn the values in life because that's not the right value they will learn if you're fighting. But what if the other person's not there? When it comes to birthdays or it comes to Christmas or Mother's Day, Father's Day, whatever, you get the kids something to give to that partner, that other person that's at home. Sounds weird, doesn't it? Why, if you've, you could have your own new relationship, you can get married, they could get married. But as long as your children are at home, you're teaching them a value in life. Just because two people don't get on and can't live in the same house together doesn't mean that happens to everyone. And it doesn't mean they can't talk to each other the rest of their life. Try that. It seems an unusual thing to do, but it really does work. Because they start seeing what they come from. They, they're really tough and they can give their parent a, a, whatever the present is, from some simple as socks or chocolate or bottle of wine, bottle of beers, um, flowers, whatever. Depends who it is. But try and give them something. Something to hold on to that they can see, ah, 
Well, maybe they only argue now here, but then they don't do it now. So things are better. And maybe they'll stop arguing among each other because they can sometimes be split on loyalties between the two. Also, they can be that hurt because of what happened before, so they can't be bothered with each other. So you find that some of the siblings will just start fighting each other because they think that's all they're supposed to do. So they don't agree with each other, argue and fight. But that can help calm it down. Letting them see whenever you are together. So if you have to meet to, for the kids to get picked up or whatever, let them see you talking civilly. Let them see how you has on and you tell them about how you're happy, how the other person's doing, and they're happy for you. That's an amazing thing as well. But those kids learn from that environment the real values in life and they, they make their own beliefs and values based around that. So try and see what works. I think overall for me what came out of like this is it takes effort. Relationships are not something that you just go in and that's that. You have to work at them. You have to constantly work at them. And you have to make sure that if you want that beautiful garden, you need to put the work in. But then you need to keep maintaining it. You need to nurture it. And it's the same as your family. If you want a family to grow, you need to maintain those relationships as well. You need to nurture those relationships so that you as a couple stay great, but also the kids learn those values and beliefs. So hopefully that's gave you something you can look at when it comes to relationships. It goes the same if it's in work or with friends, you treat it the same way. Give time for each other, listen to each other. If you do do something wrong, own up to it right away. Say it right, hands up, it was my fault, sorry. Hopefully you can move on. As long as you're doing the right things in the right way, most people will accept that. They'll realise, okay, I got it wrong. It just wasn't how it looked, but it's always done in perspective. Sometimes you won't be able to think, pack things up with it, then that's fine. You know how to move on now. So you learn from that. So next time, when you're in relationship or with friendships or whatever, you don't make the same mistakes. So thank you very much for listening again. I really appreciate it. Um, next week will be the last episode for say, this series. So if there's anything different you do want, please email me. Email me, sorry, at Tony Gordon at changingmindlimited.com. That's Tony Gordon at changingmindlimited, the limited as usual, ltd.com. And I'm more than happy to go over any subject that you want. So thank you very much again. Take care of yourself and not to those relationships. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining in today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care of yourselves.